Hey guys, so today I'm going to be talking about one of my favorite writers, and um, I definitely have mentioned him before on this channel, but never given him like his own videos, and I just think he's so excellent and he's so underread that um, I just thought it'd be a good opportunity to make just a video series on him. So the way this is going to work is um, he has technically five volume uh, collected poetry and uh, it's Robinson Jeffers. And so um, the, really the poems fit in the first four volumes though. So I'm going to go volume by volume and just give a selection of the poems that can be found in each time span. So uh, this first one is generally would be considered his most famous, I would think. Um, I'll begin by a little background of him. I'm not going to go into too much detail uh, because a lot of the information you can just find on, you know, Wikipedia for a short summary. But this is the man himself, Robinson Jeffers. So he was almost exactly contemporary with, uh, he's an American, obviously, he was almost exactly contemporary with Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot, Conrad Aiken, etc., born around the same time as Joyce. So he was born in the time that he would be considered a modernist, but he was decidedly not a modernist in practice. He, of course, knew about it all, and he... Um, went to Europe when he was younger, when he was going to school. Um, but then he moved back to America, specifically California, and then lived most of his life in California. And um, he, he uh, went through varying layers of popularity. He was pretty popular in like the 20s and 30s, but then got into some trouble by saying that the United States shouldn't have fought in World War II. So, of course, propaganda machine and um, thoughtless people uh, denounced him and he lost some popularity because of that and I think never really recovered. Also, he didn't really fit into the narrative of modernist literature, even though I love modernist literature. Um, Personally, I wouldn't exclude Robinson Jeffers from the idea of modernist literature, but he doesn't fit in the like perfect, you know, dictionary definition of what a modernist writer would be, but I don't think that matters at all anyway. But so the majority of his life was spent in nature. He lived in Carmel in uh, California, which now I guess has become like a tourist, like shit heap, <laughs> basically, but... Um, I guess uh, Clint Eastwood lived there for some time, and now it's like where rich people live. But when he lived there, I gather, it was basically he found a nice spot. And then he built this, hand-built this, uh, well, with, with money, with a lot of money. But uh, his wife was a wealthy, uh, wealthy uh, heiress to some money. But... Um, yeah, he built this place called Tor House, which is like this, if you look it up online, you can see it's a um, stone building, looks pretty pretty imposing. Uh, yeah, I think imposing would be a good, good definition or descriptor of it. But, uh, so that's where he lived most of his life, in, the, in nature, in the coast of California. And that's very meaningful, because um, part of his idea of his... Uh, poetics was this idea of inhumanism where he wanted to uh, decenter humanity as um, you know in the sense that you call something anthropocentric he wanted to make things not anthropocentric and so a lot of his poems uh, deal with uh, nature in the sense that the main character might be a hawk, uh, which is one of his most famous poems, Hurt Hawk. Or um, 
a uh, natural phenomenon might be the main character, like something like a mountain, which uh, is something I'll bring up in a, in a little bit here, another connection to Robinson Jeffers. But um, also, he really despised uh, like political groups and the kind of stupidity, the unbearable stupidity that goes along with politics. And that'll actually lead me into the first poem that I want to read. Um, it's probably, from my experience, it's probably his most famous poem. If not his most famous, it's one of them. And I love it. You know, I've, uh, I want to teach it. I taught it once. And I think it's just an excellent poem. So, all right. So this is from his first book of poems, uh, published in the early 20s. And this is called Shine, Perishing Republic. While this America settles in the mold of its vulgarity, heavily thickening to empire and protest, only a bubble in the molten mass pops and sighs out, and the mass hardens. I, sadly smiling, remembered that the flower fades to make fruit, the fruit rots to make earth. Out of the mother and through the spring exultances, ripeness and decadence, and home to the mother. You making haste, haste on decay, not blameworthy, Life is good, be it stubbornly long or suddenly immortal splendor. Meteors are not needed less than mountains. Shine, perishing republic. But for my children, I would have them keep their distance from the thickening center. Corruption never has been compulsory. When the cities lie at the monster's feet, there are left the mountains. And boys, be in nothing so moderate as in love of man, a clever servant, insufferable master. There is the trap that catches noblest spirits that caught, they say, God when he walked on earth. So, uh, I sympathize a lot with the uh, meaning behind this poem. Um, one of the lines that I really think about is, um, corruption never has been compulsory. Um, reminds me of one of my other favorite poems, uh, I Sing of Olaf, Glad and Big by E.E. E. Cummings, one of my absolute favorite poems. Corruption never has been compulsory. There is some shit I will not eat. So, um, yeah, I, I, I love this poem. And uh, continuing on a little bit, one thing that I mentioned about, you know, he might make, uh, for example, a mountain be one of the main main characters of his poems. There's this group I found recently, uh, last couple of years being recently, uh, called the Dark Mountain Project. And uh, they are a group that uh, espouses something called uncivilization. And this specific one is an anthology called Walking on Lava, Selected Works for Uncivilized Times. And the name, The Dark Mountain Project, actually comes from a poem by Robinson Jeffers. And their main idea is basically that uh, the last, you know, our culture is about breaking taboos. That's what the last hundred years have been. Maximal freedom leads to, you know, maximal imprisonment, effectively. You know, you think you're free, but then you're, you're destroyed by your freedom in the sense that, you know, you're free to do anything you want, but that freedom leads you to do something that you have no choice in um, altering. Um, I think that's a fair for a summary of one of their main ideas. But they, they do mention that one of the last taboos that has not been broken is the myth of progress. Uh, this idea of civilization, basically. And they feel very strongly that uh, progress is a myth and that, especially in the next coming years, we will see that myth be uh, broken. And uh, I sympathize with that idea. I think Robinson Jeffers saw it a little early. But um, this Dark Mountain project was basically started by an environmentalist, Paul Kingsnorth. You might know him from his book called uh, it's The Wake, right? Yeah, The Wake, which is written in like a pseudo Old English dialect. Um, he has a book called, I think, Reflections of a Recovering Environmentalist. Um, he's a really interesting guy, really interesting guy. If you haven't looked into him and you're interested in 
nature and environmentalism and stuff like that, look him up because uh, he's, he's led an interesting life. Um, and then a guy named Dugald Hine, who was, uh, as far as I can gather, just um, a smart guy, uh, studied English, and then didn't go into academia and just became a general researcher, journalist, lived all over the world, and then uh, met up with Paul Kingsnorth around 2010 kind of mutually attracted by ideas, and then they started this uh, Dark Mountain Project, started by a manifesto called Uncivilization, which is present in this uh, selection here. So if you haven't looked into them, look them up. If you like Cormac McCarthy, if you like Robinson Jeffers, they specifically cite both of those uh, people by name. And uh, they think that art, rather than science or technology, is the way out of our current predicament. And... I wouldn't necessarily make such a precise distinction between any of those, but um, I at least appreciate that they're more willing to value art when um, most of our society doesn't. And then um, one of my other favorite poems of this early period, I believe I have read this one before on, on this channel, but it was several years ago when I first found him. Uh, this one's called An Artist, and this is from uh, Cawdor, which I think is probably his most famous uh, book of poems, apart from Tamara, which is the one I read Shine Perishing Republic from. Um, apart, apart from these shorter, like, lyrical poems, or maybe shorter narrative poems would be more appropriate, he did write longer narrative poems that he's probably best known for, but I didn't want to make this video like a 30 minute video, so maybe save those for another day. But this one, an artist, is excellent. And I think it really captures his development of being an artist himself. This was when he was like firmly established as an, as an artist in the sense that he knew what his style was. He was writing excellent work by this point. This is the late 1920s. Um, he was, would have been, what, about mid-30s, late 30s at this point, as far as his age. So, you know, he knew what he was doing. And this one's called An Artist. That sculptor we knew, the passionate-eyed son of a quarryman, who astonished Rome and Paris in his meteor youth and then was gone, at his high tide of triumphs, without reason or goodbye, I have seen him again lately, after twenty years, but not in Europe. In desert hills I rode a horse slack-kneed with thirst, down a steep slope a dancing swarm of yellow butterflies over a shining rock made me hope water. We slid down to the place, the spring was bitter, but the horse drank. I imagined wearings of an old path from that wet rock ran down the canyon. I followed soon. Uh, they were lost. I came to a stone valley in which it seemed no man nor his mount had ever ventured. No, uh, you wondered whether even a vulture had ever spread sail there. There were stones of strange form under a cleft in the far hill. I, tethered, I tethered the horse to a rock and scrambled over. A heap like a stone torrent, a moraine but monstrously formed limbs of broken carving appeared in the rockfall, enormous breasts, defaced heads of giants, the eyes calm through the brute veils of fracture. It was natural then to climb higher and go in up the cleft gate. The canyon was a sheer walled crack winding at the entrance, but around its bend the walls grew dreadful with stone giants, presences growing out of the rigid precipice that strove in dream between stone and life intense to cast their chaos, or to enter and return, stone-fleshed, nerve-stretched, great bodies ever more beautiful and more heavy with pain. They seemed leading to some unbearable consummation of ecstasy. But there, troll among titans, the bearded master of the place accosted me in a cold anger, a mallet in his hand, filthy and ragged. There was no kindness in that man's mind, but after he had driven me down to the entrance, he spoke a little. The merciless sun had found the slot now to hide in, and lit for the wick of that stone lamp bowl a sky almost, I thought, abominably beautiful. While our lost artist we used to admire, for now I knew him, spoke of his passion. He said, Marble? 
White marble is fit to model a snow mountain. Let man be modest. Nor bronze. I am bound to have my tool in my material. No irrelevances. I found this pit of dark gray freestone, fine-grained and tough enough to make sketches that under any weathering will last my lifetime. The town is eight miles off. I can fetch food and no one follows me home. I have water in a cave here and no possible lack of material. I need, therefore, nothing. As to companions, I make them. And models, they are seldom wanted. I know a Basque shepherd I sometimes use, and a woman of the town. What more? Sympathy? Praise? I have never desired them, and also I have never deserved them. I will not show you more than the spalls you saw by accident. What I see is the enormous beauty of things, and what I attempt is nothing to that. I am helpless toward that. It is only to form in stone the mold of some ideal humanity that might be worthy to be under that lightning. Animalcules that God, if he were given to laughter, might omit to laugh at. Those children of my hands are tortured because they feel, he said, the storm of the outer magnificence. They are giants in agony. They have seen from my eyes the man-destroying beauty of the dawns over their notch yonder and all the obliterating stars. But in their eyes they have peace. I have lived a little, and I think peace marrying pain alone can breed that excellence in the luckless race, might make it decent to exist at all on the starlit stone breast. I hope, he said, that when I grow old and the chisel drops, I may crawl out on a ledge of the rock and die like a wolf. These fragments are all I can remember. These in the flare of the desert evening, having been driven so brutally forth, I never returned. Yet I respect him enough to keep his name and the place secret. I hope that some other traveler may stumble on that ravine of titans after their maker has died. While he lives, let him alone. So, you know, I just, I just love that poem. It's beautiful. One thing I did want to, want to show you, excuse me. This is another one of his famous poems, Roan Stallion. But you see these long lines that he, that he gives you and that um, contributes to the feeling of his poems, especially the narrative poems. Really long, like Whit Whitman lines, you know, you might see in Leaves of Grass. But um, yeah, this is just going to be the first video in a series of four, at least, that I plan to make. I do have four, the four volumes of his collected poetry. The fifth is, uh, I believe, prose and uncollected and commentary and stuff, which I'll get eventually, but I mostly care about what he wrote himself um, in the sense of what he published as his poetry. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, let me know what you thought about it if you're interested in the, the coming three. Um, this will be a bit of a series. And I know I've talked about it before, but I hope to make series on my favorite writers. You know, I want to do one on McCarthy. Might go through all of his books. Of course, that'll take some time, but I'd like to do it over the next few years. And then also Gaddis. Love to do one on Gaddis. Love to do one on Evan Dara. Um, yeah. Especially English language writers, of course. So, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I think Robinson Jeffers would agree with me that uh, death is a gang boss.